ask someone what the Komietet Gosadasvenyoe Bezopasnostia is, and unless they're a Russian speaker, you're likely to be met with a blank look. Trim this cumbersome phrase down to its three letter acronym, however, and you'll probably get a response. Most people are aware of the KGB, at least to some extent. They probably know that this was a shady secret police organization, something like the Stasi in East Germany or the Nazi Gestapo. They may also know that Vladimir Putin served in the KGB as a foreign intelligence officer before he rose to power. They may have visited the KGB museums in Prague, Tallinn and elsewhere. To put it simply, they get what the KGB was all about. Dictatorial regimes based on control and compliance need security bodies. They need their secret police. But the KGB wasn't the first of these bodies in the USSR. From 1946 up until Stalin's death in 1953, the Ministry of State Security, or MGB, handled these duties. And there were others too in the complex genealogy of Soviet state security apparatus, primarily the Bolsheviks Cheka that emerged in 1917 and the Joint State Political Directorate, or OGPU, of the 1920s and early 30s. Today though, our focus is on what is probably the most notorious of all the KGB's many precursors. We're looking at the Narodny Komisariat Nutrenidel, the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, better known as the NKVD. For almost 12 years, throughout the turmoil of the 1930s, with its purges and persecution, and through the echoes of World War II, when the Soviet Union achieved victory from the very brink of defeat, it was the NKVD that ran the show, striking fear into the hearts of all outside their ranks, and many within. There are no names here. Lavrenti Beria, for example, is perhaps second only to Stalin himself in the infamy stakes. And then there are shadier characters whose names and deeds are lost in the wash of history. Boris Rodos, for example, or Leonid Sarkovsky, who took pride in their torturous methods, and Isaiah Berg, who dispatched his victims with horrifying efficiency. Together, these men were embroiled in a world of mafia-esque one-upmanship, political positioning, and bloodthirsty ruthlessness. And most would die at the hands of their former comrades. As you'll see, men like Beria represent only the very tip of this terrible iceberg. Imagine an RPG game with a detailed battle system, stunning graphics, and thrilling PvE and PvP action sponsoring this video. Well, guess what? It has. Step into the heart of Teleria as the acclaimed hero in Raid Shadow Legends. Experience a world where strategy and story converge, many over 700 unique champions with awe-inspiring skills. We love Raid's complex battle system, where each champion's unique abilities and strategic team synergy truly tests your tactical skills. Make sure to say hi when you see me in Raid Shadow Legends with my clan, the Front YT. As soon as you hit level 13, you're in. Let's team up and conquer the toughest challenges together. Make sure to not miss out on Raid Shadow Legends post-holiday thrills. Dive into the Cursed City, a massive feature with 100 stages, including challenging dual boss battles. Progress through the city, tackle quests, and you could nab a mythical champion. Plus, use the promo code RAIDXMAS before January ends for exclusive in-game rewards. Click my link in the description for a head start in Raid Shadow Legends special crossover event featuring Monster Hunter. Collect five legendary champions, each one themed after iconic creatures from the Monster Hunter series. Secure the Rathalos Blademaster legendary champion by simply logging into Raid for seven days between now and March 5th. Make sure you join the array of community activities celebrating this amazing crossover. So, what are you waiting for? Use my link to download Raid, claim your free Rathalos Blademaster Champion, and start your adventurous journey today. At the surface, we have the best known of the NKVD men. These are the former leaders, men who orchestrated terror and suffering, and who cemented their names and reputations upon the murder of others. And we're starting with the man at the very top. Born in 1899, Lavrenti Beria was a Georgian compatriot of Stalin. After distinguishing himself as the head of Transcaucasian Soviet republics, he was transferred to Moscow to serve under Nikolai Yeshov in the NKVD. It would be here in the capital that his political ambitions would go into overdrive. 
Beria is at the very tip of this grim iceberg for two reasons. One, he was the highest ranking member of the NKVD for seven years and is widely known as a result. Two, his list of crimes is staggering. Beria oversaw the last phases of the Great Purge, executing and banishing political opponents as he jostled for power. He put in place the infamous Gulag Archipelago, a vast penal network that swallowed up countless lives. He ordered the Katyn massacre, murdering hundreds of Polish army officers during World War II. He was known to use torture and murder for political gain. On a personal level, he was also known for raping countless women and even minors for his own pleasure. An even-handed view is always important when we examine history, but even the most objective view paints Beria as a deeply unpleasant and sadistic figure. The Soviet Union was not supposed to be an empire or a monarchy in the traditional bourgeois sense of those words. But still, the death of Stalin in 1953 led to a succession crisis and Beria seemed poised to take his place as the next leader of the USSR. But with Stalin gone, Beria had no one left to protect him from his powerful enemies. The official line goes that Beria was arrested, tried for six days, and then hanged leaving the way clear for Nikita Khrushchev, who had been a rank outsider, to take over as a leader. Although some believe he was simply apprehended and shot by those who had grown appalled by his behavior. Before Beria, there was Yezhov. Serving as head of the NKVD for two years before Beria took over, Yezhov could be just as monstrous as his successor. The fact that the Great Purge is also known as the Yezhov Chin Up provides some clue as to just how influential this man was in the mayhem that ripped through the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Only five foot tall and hindered by a malformed leg, Yezhov was known as the Bloody Dwarf by many. What he lacked up in size, he made up for in meticulousness and brutality. You do not need to check his work, one colleague noted. He will do it all. His only problem? He doesn't know when to stop. For a while, it may have seemed like Yezhov didn't need to know when to stop. He ordered the arrest, torture, and execution of his forerunner, Genrik Yagoda, and he rid himself of all who got in his way. He was also a favorite of Stalin. He was untouchable, basically. One of the most famous images of the Stalinist period depicts the general secretary himself beside the Moscow Canal, with Vyacheslav Molotov on his right and his beloved Nikolai Yezhov on his left. Later, the very same image appears again, but to Stalin's left, there's no one. Yezhov had learned the hard way that no one is untouchable. After falling out of favor with Stalin in 1938, Yezhov was denounced, then arrested, tried, and executed on trumped-up charges of counter-revolutionary activities. Images of him, like the ones we've just mentioned, were stricken from the record. It was on February 4th, 1940, that Yezhov met his end in the basement of an NKVD station in Moscow that had been specially designed for executions. Yezhov himself, in a final twist of irony, had designed the chamber himself. As Yezhov had been shot in a basement, or rather than the main execution chamber at the Lubyanka, the execution was kept secret for a number of years. It was thought that it was Ivan Serov, a future chairman of the KGB, who pulled the trigger, although some believed it was Vasily Blokin who held the gun. Whoever it was, Yezhov's body was cremated immediately. The man and his likeness were erased from history. Just below the surface, hidden from view, deputy commissars, regional chiefs, and high-ranking officials went about their work. The crimes of the men at this level are vast, but they're largely forgotten about by popular history books and general overviews of the period. Born in Narsov, the Russian Empire, in 1898, Mikhail Fronovsky was only 20 when he joined the Communist Party, and he quickly became a leading member of the Cheka, the Bolshevik secret police. As Deputy People's Commissar of the NKVD, Fronovsky was right beside the more famous Yezhov as a fellow architect of the Great Purge, ordering mass arrests and executions and even personally overseeing the murder of political opponents, such as Abram Slutsky, head of the NKVD's foreign department, who met his end in Fronovsky's own office. By 1938, 
Tarnovsky was highly thought of among the Soviet Union's upper leadership and was appointed to People's Commissar for the Navy. This goodwill would not last, however. In 1939, the new NKVD head, Leverin Siberia, accused Tarnovsky of masterminding a Trotskyist fascist conspiracy. Perhaps in the hope of saving his own skin and that of his family, Fronovsky submitted a confession on April 11th and was arrested the following day, along with his 17-year-old son Oleg and his wife Nina Fronovskia. Despite his cooperation, Fronovsky and his wife were executed on February 3rd, 1940, two weeks after their son. Stanislav Redines was an enthusiastic party member, serving as head of the Odessa Cheka in Ukraine and overseeing the deportation and execution of prosperous peasantry in this part of the Soviet Union. This process, known as dekulikization, resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions, of people deemed to be class enemies of the USSR. In 1933, Redinus was redeployed to Moscow, where he became the head of the NKVD units in the capital. Here, he was responsible for more purges, as Stalin sought to avenge the assassination of Sergei Kirov in 1934. Redines should have been safe. He was married to the sister of Stalin's second wife and was a recipient of the Order of Lenin. But in fact, no one was safe. Born in what is now Poland, Redines' own background would put him in the firing line. He was accused of joining up with a Polish subversive spying group and arrested in 1938. On July 21st, 1940, Stanislav Redines was executed by firing squad. Two decades later, First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev would posthumously rehabilitate Redines. Along with Mikhail Frenovsky, Leonid Sokovsky found himself incredibly busy in 1935 as the Soviet Union's leadership dealt with the aftermath of Stalin's dear friend Sergei Kirov's assassination. Zakovsky arrested, interrogated, and executed a large number of accused dissidents, and he was proud of his abilities. Give me Karl Marx to interrogate, he is reported to have said, and I could make him confess to being an agent of Bismarck. Zakovsky was not only present in Fronovsky's office when the head of the NKVD's foreign department, Abram Slutsky, was murdered, it was Zakovsky himself who knocked him out with chloroform. Zakovsky also interrogated and tortured former NKVD head Genrich Yagoda, eventually forcing him to admit to numerous crimes against the Soviet Union, including terrorism. In 1938, Order 49990 extended the Great Purge to cover ethnic Latvians within the Soviet Union. This was a bit of a problem for Zakovsky, as his birth name was, in fact, Henrik Stubis, and he was from Aishpute in present-day Latvia. Accused of organizing a Latvian nationalist movement within the ranks of the NKVD and being an agent of Polish and German counter-espionage, Zakovsky was arrested and subjected to torture himself. With Beria now making moves toward the head of the NKVD, Fronovsky got jittery about what Zakovsky might have to say about him, fast-tracking his former comrade's trial and execution. Zakovsky faced the firing squad on August 29th, 1939. Deeper down into the structure of the NKVD, we find the men who not only gave the orders, but also got their hands dirty with the actual killing and maiming. Bodies like the NKVD need their elites, but they need their middle managers and soldiers out in the field too. When the higher ups ordered arrests and interrogations, it was usually the job of other men to actually carry these orders out. One of these other men was Boris Rodos, the son of a tailor from Melitopol in present-day Ukraine, a shady figure who had once been expelled from the Communist Party after an attempted rape. Rodos went about this task with dutiful enthusiasm. He smashed Pyotr Zupov's knees with a hammer after his arrest following the failure of the coup in Yugoslavia. He beat the hell out of Nikolai Yezhov after the former NKVD head's arrest in 1939. He used torture to extract confessions of Ukrainian Communist Party and governmental heads Vlas Chuba and Stanislav Kosyo, as well as Alexander Kosarev and writer and journalist Isaac Babel on the eve of World War II. When it was former First Secretary of the Siberian Communist Party, Robert Ick has turned to be interrogated, Rudos gouged out his eye. 
Rudos was promoted to Colonel of the NKVD in 1943, but was dismissed from the NKVD's successor organization, the MGB, in 1952. In 1956, with Stalin now gone, Rudos was denounced by Khrushchev, even being mentioned by name in the famous secret speech. Despite protesting his innocence, Rudos was quickly sentenced to death, a sentence that was carried out only a month later. The scale of killing during the Great Purge was so great that new and innovative methods of dispatch were required. The step forward Isaiah Isay Berg. Berg was credited with inventing a mobile means of execution, an airtight van into which poisonous gas could be pumped, extinguishing the life of whoever was inside before they even arrived at the firing range. Isaiah Berg oversaw a huge number of executions during the Great Purge and became popular in the party as a result. When 59 corpses were exhumed from one of Berg's execution sites in 1997, forensic archaeologists believed that all but four of the victims had been gassed. Berg may have been celebrated during the Great Purge, but the end was fast approaching for him. As Beria worked to root out Trotskyists from the NKVD and from the Communist Party, he found that Berg's name came up time and time again. Accused of inhumanity, which is somewhat hypocritical coming from Beria and his senior NKVD men, Berg denied inventing the gas van. It was the charges of terrorist conspiracy, however, that carried the heaviest penalty. On March 7, 1939, Isaiah Berg was presented to the firing squad. He may have been spared a ride in one of his vans, but he would not escape with his life. Grigory Rapoport was born near Minsk in what is now Belarus in 1890 and joined the Communist Party in September 1918. In his youth, Rapoport, who was of a Jewish background, had been a member of the Pol Zion Party between 1904 and 1905. He would rise to become a leading Czechist in Ukraine during the 1920s. As head of the Joint State Political Directorate, or OGPU, in Crimea for 18 months between 1928 and 1929, Rappaport oversaw the decolicization of the region and would have been responsible for mass deportations and murders during this time. At the end of 1929, Rappaport was transferred to the Belarus Military District. He later served in the NKVD in the Stalingrad region of Russia, but it seems he fell out of favor while in this role. On July 16, 1937, Rappaport was arrested and sentenced to death after alleged party disloyalty. This sentence was carried out on February 10, 1938 in Moscow. At the lowest reaches of the NKVD's sprawling iceberg, we find men who have faded into obscurity in the decades that separate us and them. Despite this obscurity, these men were responsible for heinous acts of violence and exploitation and their stories form an important part of our understanding of mid-20th century history. Leonid Fakevich Bashtokov was born in 1900 and would have been in the first flush of youth when the Bolshevik Revolution came to Russia at the end of the First World War. By the 1930s, Bashtokov was ensconced in the structure of the NKVD, eventually rising to the rank of Major General in 1945 and later becoming Commandant of Higher Ministry of State Security MGB School in 1947. In March of 1940, Bashtakov received his promotion from Captain of State Security to Major of State Security. It was at this time that Bashtakov put together a plan that would make him infamous for his cruelty and callousness, the Katyn Massacre, which claimed the lives of thousands of Polish prisoners of war. As we've already seen, it was Beria who ordered the massacre, but it was Bashtakov and his NKVD Troika, an executive group of three officers, who were its architects. Along with People's Commissioner for Internal Affairs, Sevolod Merklov, and his deputy Bogdan Kobolov, Bashtakov drew up sprawling death lists that ran to tens of thousands of names. When these death lists reached the POW camps in April 1940, the extermination began. By the time the massacre reached its end in May, almost 22,000 Poles had been murdered. It's not clear precisely what happened to Bashtakov after the war. He retired in 1947 after a celebrated career in the NKVD and MGB. In 1955, 
As the USSR underwent wholesale changes after the demise of Stalin, he was arrested and imprisoned. Unlike most of the names on this list, and unlike the names on the list he himself drew up in the spring of 1940, he wasn't executed. Bashtikov died in 1970. Matvi Berman came from Chita in eastern Russia, joined the Irkutsk military school, and was serving as a cadet in the 25th Reserve Infantry Regiment as Russia's involvement in World War I drew to an end. By 1917, the winds of change were blowing and Berman made sure he was on the right side. He became a Bolshevik and subsequently joined the Red Army in 1918. Eleven years later, Berman cemented his grim position in the annals of Soviet history. He helped develop the Gulag system of prison and forced labor camps that have become synonymous with repression in the USSR. As head of the Gulag system, Berman used his ill-gotten resources to complete vast civil engineering projects, including the White Sea Baltic Canal in 1933. By 1935, Berman estimated there were 740,000 enforced laborers under his command. This glory came at a price, however, and countless laborers perished over the course of these projects. In at least one camp, inmates resorted to cannibalism in a desperate attempt to stay alive. Berman did not escape the Great Purge. He was demoted to People's Commissar of Posts and Telecommunications in 1938 and was expelled from the Communist Party that December. His arrest came less than 24 hours later. Convicted of terrorist and sabotage conspiracy, Berman spent just over two months in the infamous Lubyanka prison before his execution on March 7th, 1939. The idea of the cult of personality informs much of what we know about the Soviet Union and has given us larger than life characters like Josef Stalin, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, who may well have led the USSR in an alternate timeline. But the cult of control and repression is equally important. It's for this reason that Lavrenti Beria, while not quite as recognizable as the three names we've just mentioned, is still pretty well known amongst people with a casual knowledge of the Soviet Union. It was Beria's NKVD that provided the mechanisms of control through which the party presidium could keep the vast expanse of the Soviet Union in check. But Beria wasn't the first head of the NKVD, nor did he act alone during his reign of terror at the head of Russia's premier security body. The NKVD was a monster with many tentacles, which reached into all aspects of public and political life. If you had party ambitions in Russia before or during World War II, then you had to deal with these guys. Make a misstep, and arrest, torture, and execution surely awaited you. It's little wonder that so many of the names we've covered today met their end at the hands of the very security apparatus they had served so loyally. The NKVD became the KGB, known as the Sword and Shield of the Soviet Union. During those tumultuous years in the 1930s and 40s, those who lived by the sword were very likely to die by it too. But what do you think? Is there another NKVD man you'd like to add to this list? It's likely there's someone we've missed. This was a sprawling and brutal organization after all. So let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.